to record this morning's session, um, provided that no one has any objections. If you do not wish to consent to the recording, will you please come off mic and say so? All right, hearing no objections, we will go ahead and move forward. Um, I sent out a fairly late email this morning um, trying to update the invitation with the things that I wanted to be able to um, continue our discussions on if possible today. And um, have folks been able to see that at all? Some of you have gotten it, yes? Okay, all right, great. I see Melissa shaking her head. Um, let me start. I'm going to get my other window open here. So I am navigating several windows here while I'm trying to to do this. Um, OK. From our uh, let's start with the attachments. Um, I sent to you folks the PowerPoint that Point Click Care had used um, in the May 31st demonstration with you folks. Um, I'm just sending that to make sure you have that information. I know we're connecting the Unitas team and the Point Click Care team with the Community Mental Health Center IT group um, that Chris runs, but I did want to get that slide deck out. I also sent out the slide deck with respect to how some of our key initiatives and those platforms um, are envisioned to work together. Now that plat that that slide deck is from April of 2024 as we've begun digging into this work with Unite Us and Point Click Care. We are seeing some changing of the timelines. Um, associated with uh, the fact that the contract uh, with the closely referral company um, went to GNC a little bit later than we had hoped for. Um, and uh, then we've had run into some sort of technical glitches on the state side to be able to um, move forward quickly with onboarding the Unite Us team into a shared space um, that we could work on our work plans together, et cetera. But we are getting there and work groups continue to meet um, on care traffic control and on the mobile crisis services. Nikki, have we started to connect Unite Us with any other work groups yet? Um, say, who did you list prior to that? Sorry, I was... Care that's okay, care traffic control and mobile crisis. Yes, we've been working with them. I don't think that we've reached out to anybody else external to the department that I'm yeah. aware of. Okay, all right. And um, the uh, Unite Us is having, Unite Us and Point Click Care are having joint sessions um, and they will be having some joint sessions with all of the managed care organizations to start a work group. Nikki will be there as well to start a work group on how the managed care organizations will be able to use those platforms as well. Um, under the new vision for uh, the managed care company's role in managed care starting September 1st, there are some responsibilities for them to be actively providing some care coordination directly themselves rather than just through the providers and those are for very targeted populations um, at significant moments of transition so they will be using the platforms much like um, our, our community mental health centers may be to connect people to care um, and to provide a to do it in a way that has a you know a documented evidence trail um, so that we can see that activity going on so they will be pursuing that work um, the next thing I wanted to share is looking at where we were at last week. I know that folks need a spec sheet from both Unite Us and Point Click Care of what they need to identify for the API. That is going, that request is going to go into um, the email um, that I am sending with the connection for Chris Kozak to the Unite Us folks. Um, so they will get that request today. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the supportive housing and the, some of the concerns that were raised in the last meeting. And folks, 
because I'm using three screens, just jump in if you want to say something. Um, we're, we're all getting to know each other very well now. We don't need to rest on any formalities, OK? I just encourage the, the dialogue. Um, oh, can anyone hear Diana? Yes, yes. Nikki, can you hear me now? Are you still having a problem? No, I'm good. Thank you for checking. All right. All right, great. Thanks. All right. So um, one of the concerns was about uh, targeted case management under the supportive housing benefit. Um, so we we will not be, you know, forcing CMHCs to um, sort of separately provide uh, that targeted case management under the supportive housing, right? And it shouldn't interfere with your current. I know Sunshine had raised the conflict for people with spend downs um, and that we generally like to have the targeted case management under the CMHC benefit um, happen early in the month so that the spend down is met. So one of the things that after having those discussions uh, with you folks and doing a little more research into the prior authorization process is that um, we we will have to revise our workflows such that the um, referral for the person to begin access to this service. And I'm just saying referral if it's a current client that you have and um, you believe they would be eligible for the supportive housing service, um, then you, you folks might be making the referral to the regional access point for them to be able to get the service. Uh, it's probably going to run a little bit more organically like your current access, your current services do. You get a new client or you have a current client, you've got a care plan, you're developing an update to it. Oh, they need this service. If it's a service that requires an op a prior authorization, you request the prior authorization. It's probably going to run a little bit more like that. We we met with you folks last week. We've only had one um, half hour to 45 minute together internally to, to start redoing those workflows. Um, so I don't have more definitive answers for you folks, but I did want to change sort of that dynamic to think um, that we had proposed before, which was that uh, we would do the prior authorizations and then get them to you folks. I think it makes sense, um, given what we've learned about this dynamic a little bit better, to sort of revert back to the more traditional gets built into a care plan and then the CMHC um, seeks the prior authorization when they're ready to seek it, that type of scenario. Is that about uh, Melissa and Lorian, not to put you on the spot, but I think that's where our thinking is going right about now that we need the providers to seek the prior authorizations. OK. And um, Diana, just to add to it, we um, just I want to make sure everyone knows that we're not just giving this a half hour a week. We have a full hour scheduled for early next week, and we are continuing to um, reach out to our internal partners to make sure we're addressing your concerns because we don't want to set you up for failure and we don't want to set ourselves up for failure either. So. Um, I know our answers aren't always as fast as we would all like them to be, but it's because we're doing our due diligence to make sure we're getting the right answer. That's a great point. Um, we we do really need to recognize that this service intersects with other systems as well, and um, we're getting, you know, sort of door knocks from a lot of different systems. Um, we recently we have a a new meeting that's scheduled because another voice from another system is heard. And they have other questions and that's surfacing like, OK, how does this how will this dynamic work there? Um, so we apologize. We know 7-1 is coming, but we don't have anyone fully enrolled yet and we will do this right. And if it takes a little bit longer than 7-1, that's what it's going to take. Kelly. Right. Yeah, so. You need the provider to get the PA. If it's going to be under the supported housing benefit, because we don't get a PA on the community mental health side, right. I just want to. So we have two different processes, maybe to access the exact same service if the expectation continues to be that people will either get the service under supported housing or they'll get it under mental health. So that's one little pathway that creates a problem in my in my mind thinking but the next thing again is and i'm sorry that i keep saying it and i know it's ad nauseum melissa and diana is that the scope 
of expertise that you are expecting for people as it relates to housing and legal and and eviction and all of those things is broader than the scope under mental health that people know like it's a specialty and so it's it that's the other issue inherent issue for us around expecting mental health case management to do exactly what you have predicated in your sparring and the benefit for supported housing but i defer to any other center to please say yeah kelly we don't see it that way and it isn't an issue for us especially because i say this to poor diana and melissa and her team on every single meeting <laughs> It's all right, it's good for us to hear. So other centers, are you feeling that way too, that this is not like for the case management part, you're probably not going to want your center staff to be the case managers for that benefit? Before they say that, I'm not saying we don't want them to be, I'm just saying the scope is bigger. So my bench can, my, mental health case management bench, I'm going to make up a number, can take 50 cases. But if I make them start doing this level of detail and specialty, even if it's only five of them, their bench has to shorten. There's more to do for people who are in this type of benefit need. Their housing needs and support can are bigger than the productivity that I can manage and my current expectation. Yeah, Kelly, I'll just add to that. I don't disagree with you. Um, <clears throat> I mean, when when we get into more complex housing, you know, we're usually working with CAP or somebody who is uh, entrenched in this on a more regular basis. Um, so as our care coordination, we'll coordinate those types of services, but we're not the one shepherding it all the way through. Um, and think about you could you know think about a, a, a medical case manager um, working on a particular disease right we're, we're, we'll coordinate activities but we're not going to be that disease manager right so there's there's limitations to what we do um, and I agree with Kelly that the scope goes well beyond that so it's interesting because what you just said Chris sounds like my impression exactly of what case managers are doing for the CMHCs. They are happy to, you know, develop that plan of care, working with the respective team members to what should be in that plan of care based on that person's needs and coordinate, but they're not delivering that deeper level service. I mean, that would be the supportive housing specialists in, in my mind. So I'm trying to figure out What's uh, what's not connecting for me? Um, you may be connecting it. It's just there's there are supporting housing specialists. I'm 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 struggling as why we would add uh, supported housing specialists to the mental health centers when they exist in other entities. When you know they they specialize in that all the time. This would be a, a subset of our population in it. Why wouldn't we just continue to coordinate under the current case management as opposed to take on uh, an entirely new realm that somebody else is doing? Okay, so what about your housing specialist that you have right now? Uh, they're targeted to bridge. Right, but if they could be, if that work is reimbursable under Medicaid, wouldn't you want that? Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, it's I'm, I'm not sure how others are. We've rotated through a lot of housing specialists. We've had some good some ones. We've had some OK ones. Um, uh, you know. And Diana, if you're if you're saying and, and I do feel like Melissa, your team last week sort of started to become a little clearer on this path, but there are just a lot of connection issues. If you're saying, hey, guys, that stuff so what the supported housing specialist would do you'd do the same equivalent level of case management then i i can that helps me breathe a little easier in terms of thinking of the depth of my bench and 
in my capacity to meet people's needs based on the staffing resources that I have. But I just want to be clear, if I am going to make a referral through RAP for supported housing, um, and can I refer just for housing supports? Because I don't necessarily want to refer them out of my case management. They're getting case management. I, Diana, I think I need to whiteboard this for a second, and I can't do that here because, right. um, but I, Kelly, you're, you're making something click for me and Diana. I think when we do our next session next week, I can map this out in a way that I think might make sense for the next time we come to this group. Kelly, you just made it, something is starting to click and I'm, I just need you to sort of ruminate on it. Yeah, yeah I like the idea of you whiteboarding it. Thank you. If they we don't have, Zoom, have to. We could whiteboard it. Yeah. <laughs> don't get they us don't, started on Zoom. <laughs> they don't have to receive um, all of the benefits. So if you have existing case management, then in that domain for housing is where you could put the at the plan of care, if you will, for this particular benefit. But they don't have to get the separate supportive housing targeted case management which means if you were a community mental health center and you had a housing specialist and a client that needed supportive housing um, transition or sustaining services, then what you would essentially start billing for under the benefit would only be that service. It wouldn't have to be the other services. And Diana, because that's under a different enrollment, that's not going to be flagged as a conflicted case management? No, those other is services, somebody... the actual, what the housing specialist would do is not case management. No, I understand that. But if somebody is already receiving mental health services and case management for that, and that case manager is writing the plan, and then housing services are part of the plan, they're not billing case management under the housing benefit. Right. That can yes. be done. Yeah. And then so that's what Melissa is going to try to white, white yes, board. Yeah. It's all making sense right. in my yeah. head. And and Diana, yeah, I think we, I think um, Diana, we have a visual that starts to explain this. And I think we can take right. maybe that's just the, the column CMHC yeah. column and break it out a little bit more mm -hmm. because I have right. I I think it is the flow is starting to make sense. And Nikki, you and I are going to have to spend some more time with our workflow. <laughs> but yeah, in a good I mean, way, like these conversations are really helping us break down those steps that we need to clarify. Most definitely. Right. And the workflow is getting big, but that means we're thinking of all of those things. So I think this is great. The bigger it gets, the, the better it Bear be. in mind, folks, the, the reason the workflow is getting big, there's only a few services with here, but why it's getting big is because we have to keep the access point in as that sort of um, first approach to application for the actual service to be qualified for it. And then we have to have those uh, case scenarios where someone doesn't have case management somewhere and they'll need that service. Um, and then the other right. uh, so actual um, housing specialist service, if you will. Right, we're, we're, our we're workflow is start to finish. Yes, sorry, and it includes yeah. all, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, mm -hmm. but it includes all of those decision points. So all of the things that you're bringing forward, we're putting into this workflow. So we appreciate your feedback and we need it to make it very comprehensive. So I, I hope that is, um, just, go ahead. Oh, this is Patricia. I just wanted Hi. to say, respond to Kelly because we also have a relatively large homeless outreach team whose scope is much bigger, and they are people who aren't receiving services from us yet. And I think that they fall into this category of being able to, once the referral is made through the access point, they, we would have people who are not uh, currently um, billing for all the case management service that they're doing. So. Same, Just to put it out there as a center. I'm yeah. sorry? Same on our yeah. part, too. So when yeah. Melissa, so, I mean, you're contemplating is... the door, your doorways are people who currently have it and doorways for people who don't. But 
whom also a doorway for people who are coming in to a center that may offer case management versus coming in through a provider that doesn't offer case management. So, so Pat Patricia, did you have a question or was it just sharing that input? No, because Kelly asked of, of people who have the wider scope and okay. that team does. They okay. just do. Oh, all right. They have the that sort of knowledge, and so I wanted to just say, as an organization, we do have that. So it would Thank fall you. into this category. Yeah. And Lisa, I see you toggling a little bit on and off on on your mic. Did you want to jump in? Okay, it doesn't look like it. Um, I put up the on the screen here the actual housing transition supports and this title CMH housing coordinator is um, because we know that you folks have positions that maybe you're calling them housing specialists or housing coordinator so it was just sort of it's not something that's built into the 1915 I next necessarily but when we look at these um, these services are these services that you feel needs a higher level than what your housing folks could do or does this seem a lot like what they already can do if they have the capacity, like the actual bandwidth? I'll speak for us. I mean, I think our housing folks can and do do this. And my points before, to be clear, are relative to my non-housing team. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I, for I, 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 Sorry, Diane. I'm just Kelly. For some reason today, your questions are making my brain work properly. Whereas last week, I felt like it, maybe I didn't make the right connections. I really do appreciate your questions because um, I feel like this is this is helping us point into a much better direction. Um, so thank you for your willingness to bring all of this forward. Chris, you were going to say something. I was just going to uh, concur with Kelly for our folks as well. In terms of what they're able to do, I think the key word is capacity. Right. Um, and oh, speaking of capacity, I know Kelly, like you had raised the number 50. Our original budget for this was projecting like only 60 people in the first year. Um, so we're not predicting a huge um, volume that would increase for this. Um, we just, uh, I mean, we do. Hopefully Medicaid still has enough funds if we do get a significant amount of interest, but um, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Anyways, where I was going with this is um, for your ACT teams, the individuals would need to still get their services from their ACT teams, right? That was one of the concerns raised. We don't want to jeopardize fidelity on that front, right? Do you think that the ACT teams would have the ability to take care of these uh, to be able to provide this kind of service? Are you asking if we'd have the ACT staff billing in two separate systems? If they, right, yes. I mean, it'd be or, the same computer system, it's just under your different provider number. Provider type, sorry. Or is it that the ACT team does more of that initial case management stuff? And if this is identified as a need, no, that would connected. be a fidelity problem. The, the okay. ACT teams need to deliver the, the all of okay. the services as part of fidelity. That that was one of the concerns that had been raised. Got um, it. I think I got it. Just curious. Act does the act practice actually? I'm not sure how a new benefit in a completely separate section of the Medicaid program becomes absorbed as a requirement of the act team. I see why it's important for the ACT team who's meeting all the needs of that person, 
but under your best practice, like the concept is that the ACT team is providing all of the mental health benefit. And now I yeah, hear you, the question. It, 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 yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. It's well, kind of where my head went, Kelly, that I don't, it, I'm not sure in reporting back through Phoenix and other things, how it gets captured and how we make sure it's all attached back to the ACT team and not, when, when you start coding it to a different program, then it's not ACT. And so I don't know that you get credit for fidelity under ACT. I, I don't, my, my mind would have to do some gyrations around this to make sure that that all ties together. So in your yeah. systems right now, you have cost centers associated with ACT, correct? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know why I'd have my ACT team build this service. Right. I mean, the, the person would already be an open active case with the mental health center and be served by ACT. So I don't know why they would be why they would build this. Why wouldn't you want to build it if they're working on housing? needs of the individual. That's one of the covered domains of the model. And one of the traditional problems we've had with that is a lot of the services were not reimbursable, not billable. But wouldn't they be doing that through case management anyway? The care plan they would be, but the actual doing what you're, you know, helping them actually find their housing um, and be successful once they can get housing. Right and build now, a relationship have, with the landlord. Look at the right. scope that's up here now. I think the in part and partial the question is, does our ACT team have the bandwidth to do all of that? Like, I know we couldn't take on all of that for all the people. I know it's only 60 statewide right now, but <clears throat> for all, all clients <laughs> or because in my mind, if it got to the level where they needed the type of services that you are contemplating as pre and post housing supports, um, I'll just be transparent. If Steve sat down with me, I'd say, I think our workflow would be that we would make a referral to the provider of um, the transition and sustaining services and that they're not contemplated anywhere. They didn't even exist when the manual and the best practice you know for act <laughs> was evolved so i don't think in terms of meeting um fidelity to um a an a, a pre-existing <laughs> practice a best practice could ever have contemplated something that's only <laughs> being created now so housing needs are not part of the domains that are covered under ACT? It depends That's to it. what level of detail. Right, it, it, yeah. <laughs> so we, if they get in over their heads, Diana, if they get into some subject matter, they would just turf it to our housing specialist. And is that getting captured under the fidelity that they're getting connected to other people rather than the ACT team delivering all of the services? Is that impacting fidelity right now? No, not that I'm aware of, but I don't remember us getting a hit on it. So, Well, and that was sort of where I was going with, could that be the flow where if this comes up as a need and it's special, like it's a specialty need, could those housing bridge staff be the ones that help with it. But I don't know enough about the ACT requirements, but in my mind, that makes sense. But I think yeah, I need so, to learn more. So, do you know, Dr. Burnett had um, raised the concern also as, about how this could negatively impact ACT fidelity if these services were being provided by somebody other than the ACT team. Um, and in the old position that I had, I was much more familiar with everything in ACT for Fidelity purposes. But I think what we were looking at is this provides a reimbursable service that helps fulfill the need of those individuals on ACT that perhaps um, centers weren't able to bill for. Um, or maybe, maybe, I mean, if they were doing this, if an ACT team was doing this kind of, of work, not necessarily every little thing that's on here, but if they were working on housing needs with someone, what would they bill that 
to you? What would that service be? Would it be a functional support service? Uh, it depends on what they're doing. So yeah, if they're helping the person, um, you know, negotiate symptoms so they can fill out forms or you know some of the bullet points on here, it would be functional support. If they're doing the kind of linking, monitoring, brokering, it would be case management. Okay, all right. So then for individuals with ACT, so I, you know, I just happened to, to know the rates for the functional support at the 15 minutes and it and at 15 minutes and ends up being um, a higher rate per hour than what this will be per hour. Um, so I would say in those cases, you're not going to want to access this benefit for that person because it would make no, no sense if your teams are already providing um, the service under a different code and at a higher rate, you wouldn't want to use it. Currently, though, they're probably um, PM, PM, MCO patients that are being covered under capitation. So we're not actually getting fee for service dollars for that in in this housing benefit. It's paid outside of capitation, correct? So it could be additional dollars. It'll be in fee for service at least for a year. That's a good point, Allie. The other uh, side we, of that equation, not... though, hang on one second, Chris, before I lose the, uh, the thought. The other side of that equation, though, is if you can provide a service at a higher rate, even under the capitation, that does speak towards the dollar value of the next year's capitation rate as well. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so uh, thank you. I was going to make that point, um, Diana. So I agree with that. I think the other when you know, especially when I think about our ACT team, um, Less than half of our ACT team folks are in managed Medicaid. Most of them are Medicare. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm not sure the full impact. Um, right. And and it actually could support and uh, and a, a better rate for you in the out year. Um, so it uh, and it, it's it's a little more complicated, I think, than um, than just that immediate capitation because it comes down to who actually has capitation. And what's it doing for your um, uh, as much as MOE is going away, your MOE, because functionally there's still going to be some uh, attachment back to that. Right. Um, so it, I, I don't know. So and let Diana, me ask this. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. I appreciate Dr. Brunette's perspective. I, I'm trying not to let my reaction be my response, but I'm not doing <laughs> very well. So have That's some okay. grace on this. I think she has a conflict of interest. And okay. as the evolver of best practices and perhaps act. But that being said, there's no way she could ever have contemplated these elements for this population when she created or when the team or Dartmouth or anybody created the best practice 10 years ago. Right. Um. I will say, though, that because housing is an I, I, I will share that I look at this as a um, as Medicaid filling a hole for a, a service that was critically needed and that wasn't adequately reimbursed in the past. Um, now, if we move to, you know, we want to develop act rates that are specific to act like a, a half day rate or, or per diem rate, or I think we've also tossed around the idea of um, uh, different rates based on how long the person has been in the ACT program and you know what their needs are. We're, we're not there yet. Um, we'll, we're going to need deep conversations with you folks on that. But for right now, we don't. And essentially what happens is we bill it, we bill ACT services at sort of the widget rate, the CPT code level at that whatever that dollar is. Um, regardless of the per member per month, it's still it still counts towards the development of the rate. So we were looking at this, or I, I'll just speak for myself, I was looking at this as a way to fill one of those gaps in revenue to support ACT um, in those cases. That being said, it's you folks don't have to deliver the service. If the person's on ACT, you can keep billing it under ACT, that's fine. Um, if we want to keep the option open though, I think what I'm hearing is we would want to make sure that we had coding that would indicate that the ACT team had delivered it so it's hitting your cost centers and it's hidden Phoenix the right way. Is that correct? I, th I think so. I, th I think we need to know a little bit more, but I think that sounds right. Okay.
So Lorian and Nikki, I know Jeff's not here with us today, um, but I would want to make sure that we just make a mental note to connect with um, the Phoenix team on that so that we're making sure we're identifying the correct coding strings that we would want to pursue. Okay, I'll make a note about that. Diana, I also just want to say that, you know, from an ACT perspective, when you're looking at sort of all of the components of ACT, um, I, I also want to say, because you said the issue of sort of referring people out, um, you know, right now from an fidelity model, supported housing specialists are a part of the team. So it, it's not that you're referring people out. It may not be the clinician or the case manager, um, but it, it is a part of the essence of ACT services to provide to have housing specialists on the team. So good. So you're depends. counting them in those FTEs, those contacts in the Correct. whole fidelity. Good. Great. Right. I mean, that's at least from my perspective, but yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. I'm just making myself that up my own note there. Um, OK. So let's see. Um, I'm just trying to make sure we're talking about the issues. Um, again, with Bridge, if your housing specialists are primarily funded um, under your contracts with Bridge, they're providing these services. You know, that brings a different revenue stream. It helps you use your contract funds in a different way. That's one one way to think about that. Um, Let's see. There weren't any questions about the qualifications. There was a question about how this benefit intersects with H2020 in the CMHC group home. If the CMHC is providing in-home services versus external partners, how do these intersect? So the um, we had looked a little bit more deeply into the language around the CMHC residential services and if the if the CMHC is billing for H2020, um, I think that this would be considered an overlapping service at that point because H2020 is a per diem um, therapeutic services to help the individuals uh, remain successful in that residential setting. It could be that there would be a scenario where if the individual is looking to step down into like their own apartment, then the transition side of the supportive housing services may make more sense at that point because they're going to be working with someone who's not necessarily part of the residential team um, and is it's going to be for that transitional purposes and you can have those um, when they're stepping down. So we'll we can look at that more deeply, talk about that more. But does that sound like a reasonable approach to folks? OK, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to also simultaneously take my notes. All right, I'm going to stop sharing that screen for now. Well, wait, before I do, does anybody have any other questions or concerns about these two um, services potentially being, you know, aligned with the activity of your housing specialist, for example? Before I take it off screen, OK. Melissa, did you have any other questions or Nikki Lorian from our little work group? Not today, but thank you. Thanks. No, I don't. Great, thank you. OK, um, let me open this back up. All right. I wanted to touch base on the ARPA mobile crisis um, state plan amendment that we had submitted. So we had submitted an initial draft. We officially submitted it. I think it was late last Friday or Monday morning to CMS. So um, where we ended up landing, which is the biggest, you know, sort of sticking point that I want to share with folks today is 
CMS did come back and I think I had shared this with you that they had indicated that um, in order for it to be a qualified service, it had to be multidisciplinary. So it had to have um, your a person licensed to be able to perform an, a, an assessment under you know, our state law. So currently that's our master's level and it could be a peer or someone else um, that's appropriately you know, determined by the state as trained, right? Um, but it had to be a two person response. One could be by telehealth, that's absolutely fine. Um, but it had to always be two, and they don't always have to do a, an assessment. So did I, I talked about that last week, right? You did, it confused all of us because that's not how we would normally think about that, but yes, you did. Okay, thanks. Um, so that's really where they landed. And as, as folks may recall, we had submitted the draft um, in time for it to be effective for April 1st. So when we do get to yes with CMS, it'll be retroactive to April 1st. Now, what we had done is identified for our internal um, financial team, we identified the appropriate place of service codes that would meet CMS's definition of it being a community develop, uh, delivered service. Um, they're very particular that it's not a facility based service. So we had provided our financial team those codes so that they would be um, sort of flagging those claims as they came through MMIS as the ones that we would be claiming that enhanced um, federal match on. Given the clarification that we got from CMS about what will qualify for the ARPA, we revisited our billing guidance and um, the, the modifier that had originally surfaced as indicating uh, a compliant ARPA team really isn't necessarily indicative of a compliant ARPA team. That was the, the use of the H2, uh, HT modifier for a two-person team. But under our current billing guidance, a two-person team doesn't have to include a master's level person. So we are gonna have to revisit those claims to determine if we actually could um, submit them for that enhanced FMAP. I've got a meeting scheduled, I think it's at the very end of today with an internal financial team about our options there um, to go forward and then also, also retro actively. Um, I'm thinking that what we'll need to do is take all of the HT claims that we have and ask for the centers to look at your data in terms of being able to identify, you know, which one did have a master's level on it or which ones didn't. Unless you know that there's a way that we could actually see that in the claim um, I don't work with the claims at that distinct level, so I don't know that there's any way I could see it. Kelly shaking her head. We would not be able to see it in the claim. All right, so it would need to be like a cleanup job. The other thing is, is for the other two codes, so there's three codes that have the special modifiers, and then the other two, the 90839 and 90840, I believe, they only have the U9 modifier, uh, you know, they have the HW and the U1, U2, and then the U9, but they don't have the, the HT, HO, HM, or HN modifiers because they weren't, the pricing on those weren't dependent on who's responding. I don't know if there's a ton of those, those units being billed, but for all of those units, we would need to find out if a master's was involved. Well, actually, if two people were involved, and one was a master. Those would have to be done by a master's level clinician though, wouldn't they as a, a 90839? Yeah, I'm seeing, well, yeah. I, I know that there's been a lot of allowances and leeway because we've had a we've had some struggles with staffing, so. I mean, it's psychotherapy for crisis, so typically those would be a master's level hire or someone who is an intern working towards their master's, which is considered master's for billing purposes, so. And those I wouldn't be done could, by a team. I agree completely. I think you could easily probably just poll centers on how they map to that code and then save yourself the pain point of trying to map each line of 
payment to whether or not there was a team, you'd be able to then filter those out. And maybe somebody isn't mapping that way, but by and large, it's a master's level service. Okay. And the purpose and of this is just to um, allow the state to draw more match, not impacting payments that we've received at this point. Right. Right. So that's why I'm saying it's sort of a cleanup thing. Um, and then we want to change the billing to go forward so that it's uh, more automated. Um, so, so y y we, but what I'm hearing is 99% of the time, basically, a very high percentage of the time, it's either a master's level or a person who is able to bill under master's be under our given rules. Um, where where some of the teams have needed to um, be able to sort of deploy a little bit differently than what those billing guidance, which you know they were drafted back in 2022, it wouldn't have been any of those changes wouldn't have been for 90839 or 90840. We wouldn't be making exceptions there, right? Okay. All right, that's super helpful. Now, are you also saying that those would have been two person teams and we don't need to worry about that? 90839 is not typically a team service. No. Right. Correct. An individual. Okay. So those would have been off the table anyways. Correct. Okay, thank you. That is super, super helpful. Diane, I have a question. Yes. When you're going back, and I know that, you know, Jay just asked for the clarification, but I want to make sure that I understand it too, that when you're saying CMS is clear and they're coming back and it needs to be multidisciplinary and it needs to be a two-person response and that doesn't necessarily align with our guidance, Am I hearing that our model going forward is going to change to comply that all services are going to meet those requirements or only the services we claim for enhanced match? Um, we're not changing the model to make sure they all comply, right? It's not the extra 35% of federal match is not going to override the concern for actually getting people in crisis services, right? That's that's mission one on that front. Um, it's just going to help us <laughs> um, with the deficit that we're looking at in Medicaid. Um, and unfortunately, that's just the nature that we're at right now. We're doing a lot of things and we're expanding services in a lot of different places, not just here. Um, but it's not going to control um, the model. So, well, Diana, just, just to clarify, I thought I heard, and I might have heard it wrong, that um, any MC underscore, any mobile crisis service would have to be started by assessment by a master's level clinician. Doesn't have to have an assessment. You have to have a master's level. You have to have someone who's capable of an assessment in case it is clinically needed but they CMS is not putting itself in that space of saying it's always clinically needed. They they don't want to play that role. They and literally a peer can us that. And a peer can determine what's clinically needed at that point if they're the first point of contact? Um, it needs to be a two-person deployment. So you need to be able to have that, the at least the master's on, like the master's is in that session with the peer but, and if it's not needed that's fine but if it's a peer and a bachelor's it's not ARPA compliant and that means we won't get the enhanced funding so we need to make sure we have coding that makes it easy because we, we will get this for three years so we want to make sure we have coding that will with great certainty um, or as much as we could ever get with any billing and claiming uh, indicate that it was a compliant service so part of what we're looking at is um, a modifier change 
so that the centers would be able to, you know, use that modifier to indicate it was a two person response, one of whom was capable of doing an assessment under our current laws. Does that make sense? It, yeah, it's helpful. Yeah, and I'm just so if it's not a two person response, can it peer begin an episode? Yeah, because it's, it's just going to be covered under in, regular Medicaid. Yes, yep. it wouldn't be under enhanced match. Yes. Yeah, I'm asking so, that because we're meeting. I'm meeting with Brian Harvey today to argue that point. So thank you. Yeah. So Brian, uh, actually, we were in a session with Brian. Um, I think it was Monday afternoon. And you know, if you've been in the work groups that he's been having on some of this work, Steve, he has a little chart, uh, particularly as we're talking about the new um, educational program for the responders that we're working on. He has a little chart and he has the circles of the current configurations and then the potential new configurations, et cetera. And all except um, the masters only would be with our, our potentially good matches for the ARPA if they actually have that two person um, response with the with the masters in it. And if they don't, they don't. So if we have a peer and a master, that's fine. A bachelor's and a master, that's fine. Um, a responder and a master's, right? But anytime there's not, it's still covered under Medicaid. It's just not going to be the enhanced Medicaid. Um, so in that ARPA, Spawn, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the time here. We have a few minutes left, about seven minutes left. But in that ARPA spa, just to remind folks, we have crisis stabilization um, deployed, crisis stabilization provided at a particular facility, like in your own center. Uh, and then we have crisis stabilization center services. All of those would be added to the regular Medicaid state plan. And again, you would not have to certify people as eligible for ongoing CMH services. Um, so I just want to keep sharing that. It'll be in fee for service. It shouldn't affect your per member per month payments. Um, if it is a, sir, a crisis service that's provided by your regular clinical team for an existing client, you're not going to want to bill it under those codes, right? You're going to want to bill it under your regular coding string for crisis services. Um, speaking of which, we will probably have to deal with modifiers for those other Medicaid crisis services that are like at the crisis center, et cetera. So right now, you folks are using the U9 to indicate that your mobile crisis team provided the service. And if it's not them, you're you're not using the U9. We're probably going to have to revisit that because we only have room for so many modifiers. And under the ARPA, it's going to be less important for us to be able to identify that it was a mobile crisis team that provided the service um, if it's not about the enhanced um, match rate. We still have to get into some uh, weedy discussions on that front, but we might be looking at some changes there for um, that, that those coding strings. So that's the update on there. Um, I don't think it'll take long to get CMS's approval, um, but this was super helpful to, um, thank you for answering those questions because that helps us um, sort of think about the retrospective piece of it um, and going back, you know, for potential months on surfacing those cases. The other thing I've already talked about that, um, we will have, a, I was gonna introduce you folks um, a little bit more deeply into the community re-entry benefit that we are trying to set up under the um, SUD SMI IMD demonstration. Um, how many folks have you, have you have a sense of awareness of that? I think we've introduced it before at a high level, but are you, does it sound familiar to any of you? No. Uh, well, Kelly says yes, but that's because you're on MCAC and you get all those updates. <laughs> all right. So this is a benefit, um, and again, we'll I'll I'll bring the slides for it um, next week so we can get deeper into it. But basically, what it is, it's uh, a way for um, people that are being released uh, from the state prison system about um, 45 days ahead of their anticipated release, we would be opening them up for Medicaid. If they would qualify for Medicaid, um, they would be immediately going into managed care. 
they would get access to um, an intake appointment, targeted case management, peer support services, and pharmaco uh, pharmacologic uh, services, pharmacological services, sorry. Um, so very limited service package for them under the demonstration. It would be Medicaid reimbursable. Um, the good thing is from the CMHC perspective, if these are individuals who would be um, identified as CMH eligible because it's starting in managed care, you would be able to start them into your cap very, very quickly. Um, so that's the great thing. It's going to be open for individuals with um, the, a mental illness history or SUD services. The MCOs um, will be encouraging the individuals to connect into the doorway system as part of that initial care management or into the community mental health system, or if the individual doesn't feel that those that those are the right fits, like maybe they had a provider in the past, a private practice, if they want to go that route, that's okay. Um, but it's, I, I'll, like I said, I'll go in and I'll bring the slides in for the next time that we go, but that's what we're looking at doing. And again, the big thing here is managed care will be on first base right from the beginning. The last update I wanted to just squeeze in is we had we, I had had critical time intervention moving to in lieu of services on this list for 2024. We were hoping to do it for September 1st, 2024. Um, for different reasons of concern at our senior level, we're looking at that instead at the earliest of 1125 and perhaps even 7125. So that is not immediately on the um, Horizon for September 1st anymore. All right, that was a lot. How are we doing? Helpful? I think Any? Excedrin moment comes to mind. So you think what? Excedrin moment comes to mind. I'm sorry, it is a lot. I was in a meeting yesterday where somebody was talking about some other new project to start and I just said I think we all have a lot going on right now. So all right um, any other questions thoughts before we sign off for today? Okay Nikki are you yeah, just waving by? Well that but also just to remind folks that these are being recorded so if there's something that you're trying to recall um, we can go back and look and, and provide you with a recap if you need it so. Yeah, and I think that um, Nikki, last week someone had asked when we will be able to make the recordings available, and I think they're really hard to email. Um, Lorian, is there a chance that we could put these these series on that YouTube channel and send a specific invitation for them? Yeah, we we'd be able to distribute the link. Yeah, okay. if, so if there are certain ones you want me to send to the Public Information Office to post on the link, I can do that. And there's Would also, guys... oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Ahead, Nikki. I've discovered there's also a recap option. So you can actually get the text as well instead of the video for folks that prefer that uh, for their own learning consumption. And that's in the Teams chat, right? So I don't know if our external partners can, can get those or not, but try to. And if you can't, then let us know because if you can get the recap, then we can save it as a PDF. I'm assuming we could download it and save it as a PDF and then send that out. All right, great. Thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful week. And um, obviously next week, much. I canceled next week's meeting because it's July 5th and I know many people will be off. So we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks. Thanks so Bye -bye. much. Great be to well. see you. Thank you. Bye-bye.